So Capo and Salmo, where would you put him on the spectrum? All right. Well, first off, I'm looking at the sweater. <laughs> I'm looking at the We're so young in this look. This game is Tony's. Revolutionaries edition on the spectrum. All right. All right. Let's start it off. Oh, Biden's a revolutionary. Yeah, he'll man. Be, he'll be spoken about in the same na- in the same vein as Che Guevara someday. <laughs> Changing our immigration policy from the ground up on day one, James. <laughs> Build back better, baby. First up, Robert Mugabe, controversial figure. Yesterday, a couple of the uh, American officials in the Kissinger party called what's been going on in Geneva a tribal dance. And they really don't feel that much progress will be made until the next set of meetings. How do you react to it? To a- well, if it was a dance, it was a dance to our own tune. Uh, and not a dance to the Kissinger tune. And, and we are happy that uh, if we have danced, we have remained constant. Our step has been uh, uh, always uh, that there must be a transfer of power to the uh, people of Zimbabwe as such, and not um, that there should remain effective power in the hands of the settler community, which is what Kissinger had intended should be achieved by Geneva. Do you feel so Robert Mugabe here, he was an outspoken critic of the Rhodesian government. He served 10 years in prison for, uh, for sedition. Oh, goodness. He led the Zimbabwe National African Union in a guerrilla war against the British colonial government of Rhodesia. Where is Robert Mugabe on the spectrum? Hmm. African politics tends to be fairly foreign to me, I guess. And my, this is my understanding. And also kind of foreign... Uh, very removed from the way our politics work here in the U.S. So I know over there, like, tri- I guess tribalism literally um, is is a lot more prevalent. You know, you do have homogenous groups, and that's where a lot of these uh, political movements and, and big events have happened. They've been more basically on a tribal basis as opposed to kind of a left-right uh, political dichotomy that we would know here in the U.S. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I would pl- how I would place Mugabe. I feel like I've heard his name. I don't exactly know who he is, but I feel like I've heard him referred to as a dictator. I am going to put him somewhere on... All right, we've got Joe Rogan's... You can put it right here. <laughs> Joe Rogan's political spectrum, the compass that, that I said looked like a swastika. I'm going to put him... make strong men. Yeah, he's on the... Yeah, uh, hard times make... I don't know. Jordan Peterson loves talking about hard men. That's all I know. I'm going to put him somewhere authoritarian left. I think he probably uses left populist talking points, um, but ultimately he's just concerned about kind of uh, establishing his own dynasty. You know, maybe like a, maybe kind of like a, a Stalin figure. Uh, that's somewhat accurate. Yeah, you're on the right track. I thought maybe this would be an easy one because we did. Uh, he was mentioned in the Yarvin pieces we've been working on. This is Robert Mugabe on 60 Minutes in 2001. Quite the career this gentleman has had. This is what's going on in the countryside today. These scenes were captured by a cameraman for British television. White-owned farms and their black farm workers' houses are being seized and destroyed in a government-sanctioned campaign of racial and political violence. Seven white farmers have been killed so far, and not even their dogs are being spared. Damn, they're beating them people? In the past year, dogs. a major slice of the white uh, population has packed up and left the country. That's even Thousands worse. Thousands of well-educated, middle-class blacks are doing the same thing. In the once prosperous capital of Harare, there are shortages of food and fuel. And in Parliament, a resolution has been introduced to impeach Robert Mugabe. Impeach Robert Mugabe? No. Uh, so he was... Yeah. Quite an interesting figure, has a long history, long career. He, he is a, or he was, I should say, a Maoist and black nationalist. Uh, his mm. policies, his policies while he was early on in his president, presidency were mostly social democratic policies. He didn't, he didn't go too hard in the paint, as they say. He didn't go full Mao. 
but he was a Maoist, and he um, his rival party in the early days was the Stalinist party. There were two hmm. Marxist-Leninist parties sort of battling it out, um, and Mugabe headed the Maoist one, um, which is like even 2001 here, he sort of did the whole cultural revolution thing a bit uh, with this uh, basically land redistribution again. He was taking even more land away from the whites that remained in Zimbabwe and was uh, giving it to the blacks, essentially, or at least his uh, supporters. Hard out there for a white man. I know, man. This is what they're talking about. Anti-white racism. Yeah. No, this is it enacted. Um, they would be propping him up these days just for political purposes. Oh, yeah. Could you imagine a guy <laughs> like this? I mean, this the scare value that they would get. <laughs> Jesus. The Daily Wire would uh, do a daily show on this. I'm surprised they're not already. So I, he's not in power anymore, I'm assuming? I believe it was like 2011 or something. He finally was ousted okay. in his 90s. Yeah. But he was uh, very, fairly popular in the um, Global South. He was head of the African National Congress for a long-ass time. You know, he was he was a left figure that people respected. He, you know, he did some pretty unpopular shit, too, obviously. And he was definitely not, he was definitely not in favor in the good graces of the Western powers. At any point. Yeah, I'm just imagining a scenario mm -hmm. where, like, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure we give foreign aid to all these different countries and, and kind of how they would use that for political purposes if, if Biden were some, somebody doing it. You know, we give our, our regular regular annual aid package to his country and, you know, yeah, the Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, Temple, Sean Hannity all just get up in arms about how Biden's supporting anti-white anti -white groups kind of across the across Africa and, and he's arming his, his militia of, of African men to come over here and, and take over the country along with the Mexicans. I don't know, something like that. Well, they sanctioned Zimbabwe after, uh, I'm not sure when these sanctions started, I, probably 2001, but um, I'm sure the CIA was also not assassinating him. So, you know, they didn't hate him too badly. <laughs> There's always that. <clears throat> All right. Got that one right. Pretty much. Let's move along here. This gentleman, this is a deep cut. But there is a possibility you've heard of this gentleman. <clears throat> this is Jose Anselmos dos Santos. He was a member of the Brazilian Navy and became the president of a naval union in Brazil. He rose to prominence when he led demonstrations for workers' rights. He was exiled from the country after the 1964 coup d'etat, only later to return as an active member of the VPR, or the People's Revolutionary Vanguard. In 2012, Cabo Anselmo, as he is known, was featured in a piece by the magazine Epoca, based on one of his speaking appearances. Uh, quoting for, from the uh, article here, If your mind is not in accord with your heart, if you fail to be in the presence of the Creator, you run out of breaks. This is what happened, for example, when Darwin arrived with the theory of evolution. Pavlov, Freud, Lenin, and all that gang in the early 1900s made atheism become in force, and there was a separation between church and state, which had already begun with the French Revolution. This is this is translated directly from uh, Portuguese, so not the best. Okay. And here is a photo from him around the time he was giving talks. Um, this was, okay, 20, 2012, early 2000s, basically. 2010s, yeah. early 2010s. So Cabo and Salmo, where would you put him on the spectrum? All right, well, first off, I'm looking at the sweater. <laughs> I'm looking at the part in the hair and I feel like initially I was looking at him and I think I'm thinking like he looks like kind of an older, maybe respected, like a, a college professor, you know, a leftist. He, he's the one that you could go to and you can talk about, uh, you know, he's, he's read Lenin's book and he can give you, it might not be, he's not a Leninist, but he can tell you about it. He's an educated man, certainly left leaning, but then you started talking about uh, he referred to Darwin and Pavlov and Freud, and he kind of seemed to be talking about him with disdain and the French Revolution and uh, seemed to lament the loss of religiosity and uh, maybe the, the, the cultural dependence on radio and, and, you know, kind of new media sources. And that leads me just to one place, and that's, that's angry old right-wingers. And then I start looking at him some more. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that, that sweater is definitely a right winger sweater. It's got the <laughs> the diamonds to represent money. The hair part, I think, is really what, what gives it away. But anyway, so I am going to say he is a he is very socially conservative. I think he's just kind of a roundabout conservative with an emphasis on the social conservatism. Oh, this has been stolen by the filthy Jews. That wasn't him. That was Bobby Fischer. He almost, he almost looks like Saruman in this photo, doesn't he? 
You got the squinting eyes. Uh, a bit. Maybe it's just the really white hair. And the white beard, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, uh, Cabo Anselmo is a very well-known figure in Latin America, especially in Brazil, but they, they all know who this guy is. Cabo Anselmo is concerned about the current situation in Brazil. We have a communist constitution. For him, the country's main problem today is the national security of great powers, such as the United States and Russia. Silence among the early children of the Cold War. We have to keep dancing samba, applauding football, consuming punk, funks, rock from Sao Paulo, going to that naked guitarist concert, smoking marijuana, snorting cocaine to stay calm, and drinking fluoridated water. You definitely don't snort cocaine to stay to stay calm. <laughs> <laughs> he started to get rowdy, so he hasn't done drugs. It, I'm, I'm feeling stronger on the social conservatism. You have Wi-Fi, electromagnetic magnetic waves that go through your head like you're thinking about without even being aware of it. That's used on television. That's used on radio. That's used on big TV shows. It's advanced technology being used absurdly. When you pass one of those cell towers, you're exposed to electric magnetic waves. They could be giving you commands. So Cabo Anselmo was an agent provocateur from the very beginning. This was confirmed by U.S. Uh, declassified documentation. He traveled to Cuba at one point after the initial coup where he received guerrilla training. When he returned to Brazil in 1970, he infiltrated the VPR, the uh, Revolutionary Vanguard People's Party. The whole time uh, he was doing this, he was a double agent for the Brazilian dictatorship, who the United States had installed after they successfully couped the Social Democratic president, Joao Goulart. Three years later, he set up six of his comrades. One of the six who were tortured and executed was Soledad Viedma. Nice photo of her here. Huh. She was 28 years old and the granddaughter of the anarchist author Raphael Barrett. At 17 years of age, she had been kidnapped by neo-Nazis who carved swastikas into her thighs. And she was also Cabo Anselmo's wife and was pregnant with his child when uh, he set her up and had her tortured and killed. Holy shit. <laughs> what a dirtbag. Yes. Yes, indeed. This guy was a piece yeah. of work. Jesus. So from the very beginning, yeah. early in his naval career, he was uh, working for the intelligence services, the Western intelligence services, essentially. Yeah. He set up over 200 people in total, members of the VPR, including his own wife. Pretty disgusting. Jesus, what a scumbag. Yeah. And Cabo so he, Anselmo. And he, he, was, he was an agent provocateur for the U.S. government. He worked for the Brazilian dictatorship or worked for the U.S. government. And he also went to Cuba on... On assignment, so presumably, yes. Basically, yes. Huh. He wasn't directly employed by the CIA, most likely, but, you know, he was following the orders, for sure. Yeah. <sighs> wow, holy shit. Yeah, just remember that name, Cabo and Selmo. Very, very hated individual uh, in Latin America. Let's see how many. We have two left here. I don't have too many this week. Okay. But these are deep cuts. I thought maybe this would be somewhat difficult. But yeah, you got it pretty right. He's definitely conservative. Uh, he's also insane. He's like a... He's like a Facebook person, basically. He just but buys this, all the conspiracy theories. Yeah, so he, he's kind of using the same approach as uh, U.S. conservatives. You know, you go after the culture war stuff, and I guess this is kind of more relevant culture war down there than it is here. Uh, kind of strong bent towards religiosity and dislike of punk music and that calming, calm, sweet calming cocaine. All right, let's move right along. There's more to the story of Cabo and Selmo, but uh, we should move along. Hold oh, this is the dude from Kill Bill? No, this is, <laughs> this is this is a movie with a much lower production budget. Uh, this is Hong Xiaoquan. Hong Xiaoquan here was a Han Chinese from Guangzhou in the southern Guangdong region of China. His family sacrificed much to provide the funding for him to get a higher education as he was an intelligent and gifted youth. He failed the very difficult entrance exam for entrance to the political bureaucracy in China at the time three times. And he also led an uprising against the Manchu-ruled uh, Qing dynasty beginning in 1850. He had as many as two million soldiers under his command at the height of the revolution against the Qing dynasty. Where is Hong Xiaoquan on the spectrum? Huh. All right. Not a lot to go off of there, I know. So I have watched an extensive number of kung fu movies. So I, I feel like I have a pretty good grounding in Chinese history. <laughs> I always liked the Dynasty Warriors games. And that's also where I get all my uh, history lessons from. But <laughs> I feel like the Han fighting against the wealthier Manchu Chinese that were kind of in the south and eastern part. So he's uh, 
a poor fellow coming from a tribal background leading an uprising. I, I, I don't know. I'm really getting uh, kind, of, kind of a Simon Bolivar vibes from this guy. You know, he, he might be the real deal. He's this proud lefty or the, that kind of version of lefty, or I guess that century's version of lefty that, that tried to make his way through the tough, bigoted establishment of the Manchu Chinese and wasn't accepted into their culture. So he ended up leading an uprising of his fellow disaffected against the tyranny of the Chinese emperorship. So, yeah, I'm going, he, he's, whatever Simon Bolivar is, that's what he is. It's pretty good, he, he, man. He, he's, a, he's a man of the people. He's, he's honest to God. He's, he's out there looking out for the poor and disaffected of society. Hmm. That's pretty good. I'm actually impressed. That's pretty spot on, man. Uh, I think <laughs> it's a good comparison. I never really thought to compare him to Simon Bolivar, but yeah, similar sort of vein. Hmm. I guess you could look at it as an anti-imperialist action for sure. Uh, who knows if he was cynical about this whole thing or not. I guess we can determine that after we get a little more information on this gentleman, but. As the throne of the heavenly king, once God's kingdom here on earth had been established in Tony Blair, a blizzard of ideas pouring from this throne. They had printing presses here. They had a whole workshop for woodblock cutting for their publications, their translations of the Old and New Testament. That throne, man. They banned opium, tobacco, alcohol, foot binding, yeah, it's a craftsmanship. gambling. They separated the sexes. There was the death penalty for sex between men. Most important of all, China was to be classless. Private ownership of property, private ownership of land, were abolished by the state and distributed by the state. Pretty groundbreaking for 1850. The whole, that is, yeah. The whole, the whole murdering gay people, not so great. But the, the banning foot binding, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I don't know about the whole uh, banning, banning opium thing. I'm not a fan of that. No, they're... He didn't necessarily the... ban it. He, he blocked the import and export of it. I don't, I don't think he actually banned it uh, explicitly. Okay. I mean, well, essentially, that's just banning the export because, like, that's where all the opium come from. So, yeah, keep it all for yourself, buddy. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, Don't let those damn British come get all your sweet, sweet opium. A little more info about this. This is fascinating to me, uh, the history of China. Hong Xiu Quan suffered a mental breakdown after failing the test the, thir the fourth time. Uh, I'm sorry, this was the third time. So this was uh, before the revolution. During this third, uh, after the third failure, he had a mental breakdown where he spoke to a heavenly figure who gave him a sword to defeat the demons in his vision. After failing the test a fourth time, he proclaimed that the figure he had seen in his visions was God and that he was the brother of Jesus Christ. <laughs> he had been given this information and he set out to uh, fulfill his mission after defending the heavenly kingdom several times, uh, this was the kingdom he established with his revolution, which was very successful for a number of years and got very large, as we discussed, two million people at one time, two million soldiers at one time uh, fighting for him. <clears throat> and they conquered a lot of eastern, southeastern uh, China. After defending the heavenly kingdom, which is what his uh, area, his jurisdiction was called, several times, the, the Qing dynasty forces led by European generals and with the backing of the wealthy elites, surrounded and starved out the Han ruler. He died as the city of Tingjiang was surrounded, perhaps by suicide, perhaps from eating wild grasses for survival. It's unclear how he died. Maybe he poisoned himself, there's speculation, or um, it could have just been he ate some poisonous plants to survive as the city was under siege. The final death toll after the final resistance groups were wiped out is estimated at between 20 million and 100 million many from disease and famine. So this was the, this was the total number of, uh, of deaths resulting from this war on the, uh, the heavenly kingdom that he had established. They crushed all the resistance. They even went into for different countries in Southeast Asia to root out the remaining followers of this guy, Hong Xiao Quan. He outlawed polygamy, but he himself is reported to have had 88 wives because, you know, brother of Jesus and all. Yeah, of course. So cool story. Yeah. I have heard of this guy before, and uh, now that you start mentioning that, like I've, I've heard this story before, and yeah, he, he's certainly a bit more of the religious nut than I was I was picking up initially, which kind of also makes sense though, and it's a good 
something to think about. Like, would it be better to not have, uh, assuming that, let's say good come of it, and obviously it didn't, everybody everybody starved, or everybody, you know, got killed by the Western-backed Imperial forces, but would it be better better to not have a revolution and or to have a revolution that helped people, but you have a religious nut at the head and the reasons that are kind of behind what's going on, like the, the stated purpose of the revolution are these kind of purely religious notions and not just that it's something that needs to be done. Well, you're coming at this from the position that uh, religion is poison, it poisons everything. Wasn't that yes. t- the title of one of Hitchens' books? Religion poisons everything, or something like that. Uh, yeah, uh, God. God is not great. How religion poisons everything. Oh, like, there I'm, you go. <laughs> I would probably say that the whole Jesus brother thing was orchestrated after he realized he wasn't going to make it in the political bureaucracy, and he decided to take matters into his own hands. Um, probably realizing that the peasantry would be most convinced if he was some sort of religious figure, based on the the sentiment hmm. at the time. That's what I would say. I wonder if maybe he was appealing to Western forces with that, like maybe in his understanding, his understanding of, of, of kind of how Europe is aligned, you know, these are all Christian nations. So if I align myself heavily with Christianity, maybe I'll get their support in fighting against the, uh, the Imperial Chinese and what better way to align yourself with Christians than to say you're the brother of Jesus. Well, see, now you're ruining my whole... I, he's supposed to be a pure revolutionary in my mind. He's he's one of the good ones, oh. Tony. You're ruining it. Oh. Don't make him a, a conspirator uh, with the West. I think that's what he... He's just... He's he's the same agent provocateur as the last guy, James. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> no, no. It's just... It's it's purely cynical. Do not compare was, Cabo and Selmo he, to Hong Xiao Guan. <laughs> he, was, he was hoping for... Uh, he was hoping to be the Elon Musk of his time, and he wanted to just get some shares in the... East India Trading Company. Oh, he gave the, the people land, Tony. Land, just like Mugabe. He he, he bought votes, just like Biden. <laughs> just like Brandon. Just like Brandon. So this next one, I feel like you may know this one, but I guess we can go through it because it's very interesting. So this is Gordon Call. He was a decorated turret gunner who served for the U.S. during World War II. He served eight months on a two-year sentence in 1972. And he was active in an organization that attempted to organize farmers during the agricultural recession of the 1980s. Gordon Call, where is he at on the spectrum? Well, I uh, I immediately noticed he has an international harvester hat on. Um, I was going to point that out, but you said he was a farmer, so that's pretty obvious. Well, now I know that, so that's good. Yeah, yeah, that that that's an international harvester hat. Uh, I know about the... Uh, during the inflation crisis during that time, the Fed raised rates, putting a lot of farmers out of business. They weren't able to make the mortgage payments on their farm. They weren't able to pay for their equipment. I know that these guys really got up in arms, and at one point in time, they drove their tractors to Washington, D.C. to protest. That would take a while. It would. <laughs> I have a tractor. It is not very fast. <laughs> uh, it, it's, yeah, I think 20 miles an hour tops. I don't know. I'm trying to think if, uh, I guess by then the conservative forces in the U S had a very, hang on, hang on. I, I got a question to ask. Sure. What year was this that he was doing this? Like specifically, uh, the revolution. Yeah. Early 1980s. So 81, 82, 83. Okay. In that range, I will give you. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, this is when Ronald Reagan was president, early in Reagan's presidency. Say the revolution. I, so I, I'm leaning towards this guy is a, a basically somebody that doesn't. I don't know. Actually, I'm kind of going the other. I, I'm really back and forth. I was initially thinking like this was a uh, shit. What was the dude that did the standoff a few years ago? Bundy. Uh, Bundy Ranch. What was it? Clive and Bundy. I was initially thinking that this guy was. I was kind of going that that down that route that he was a Clive and Bundy type that he was mad about government regulations that maybe were or, or changes in the interest rates that were uh, messing with his farm and making it more difficult for his people. I, yeah. I don't know. I keep going back and forth. I, I, I'm going to say he's a, I'm going to, he is a, a conservative anti-government protester. He was upset by 
changes made by the government to kind of fiscal policies or uh, uh, the Fed interest rates, and he was leading an uprising. He was tired of it, just like Clive and Bundy. He was tired of it, and he was going to make a stand against the Fed. And, you know, he elected Ronald Reagan to get in there and change things, but it just wasn't happening. And he had to, he, he was going to make sure it did happen. You know, you can't, you can't trust an actor from California. You got to only trust people from Nebraska with international harvester hats on. <laughs> I don't know the Clive and Bundy case. I'll have to check that out. Uh, yeah, he's a sovereign citizen. Okay. So Gordon Call was a member of Posse Comitatus, a precursor to the sovereign citizen movement. Federal marshals set up a roadblock to arrest him for a parole violation, leaving a Posse Comitatus meeting and a gunfight ensued. Two marshals were killed and another was injured. Call fled by himself. His other, the people were, that were with him turned themselves in or, uh, yeah, basically turned, them, turned themselves in essentially. But Gordon Call fled and a manhunt ensued for him. They eventually found where he was hiding. It was uh, one of his buddies' houses. The feds surrounded Gordon Call's abandoned farmhouse in North Dakota. They, he was not there. He was in hiding. They unloaded hundreds of rounds of ammunition into his empty house and killed his dog. They eventually located him in a friend's house in Arkansas. State, local, and federal police arrived. The state, the uh, local, the sheriff went in uh, with two other people that were there at the time. The sheriff got into, saw Gordon Call, got into a gunfight with him. They both shot simultaneously. Call was hit in the head, killing him instantly. The sheriff was hit in the chest, and he struggled his way back to his pol uh, police car. The other two officers that were in the in the building, the state boy and the fed, they were already on the scene. They started randomly firing their shotguns after they heard the, the exchange between Gordon Call and the sheriff. Um, All cops are pussies, yes. One of the cops... One of the cops shot uh, the sheriff in the chest with a shotgun, friendly fire style. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. The three officers uh, retreated uh, where the sheriff gasped his last breath, supposedly. I got him. <sighs> then the SWAT team waiting outside fired thousands of rounds into the house and then poured diesel fuel down the chimney and burned the house down. Jesus. Holy shit. <laughs> They're gonna punish the house for uh, <laughs> Gordon yeah. Call killing the uh, killing the sheriffs. <laughs> wow! Holy shit! Yeah, this they is went a, all out on that one. This is a crazy story too. The uh, the initial exchange was pretty intense. They've made two movies, I think, about this this particular case. The standoff between oh, the uh, sheriffs uh, serving him for the parole violation. I, I guarantee, if you go to Clive and Bundy's house, this was on his recently watched Netflix. Like he he probably watches this. Was that after? At least, was Clive at and Bundy after this? Clive and Bundy was like 10 years ago. Oh, seven, really? Years ago. Interesting. Yeah. So this is his son. Arkansas, his friend's son, place. I think. Shootouts, tax protesters, and fugitives. Where he was hiding. Just never have been the source of much talk around here. That is, not until this past weekend. Picking up the pieces. That's what everyone seems to be doing. While the local sheriff was being buried, the, the family house. of the last two people he arrested was trying to figure out what had happened. And if one of the first two shots killed the man the police wanted, they wondered why the house was set afire. But the <laughs> people who hid Gordon Call in this house think the authorities aren't telling the whole story. Looked like a dang disaster to me. You know, mess. It's overdid is what it is. From all accounts I heard so far, just excessive power. Writers in laws are in jail because they hid the man who killed Sheriff Gene Matthews, Larry and Norman. I don't know if insurance covers that if the police just blow your house away and then burn it down. Yeah, definitely not. I, I, I feel like I've heard about not this case, but like that in particular happening. There was somebody that uh, the cops went to the wrong house on a, a warrant and like somehow or another the house caught on fire it got destroyed and insurance wouldn't cover it and the police department wouldn't cover it because they consider it like i don't know just a, a whoopsie daisy i guess but yeah this the city would not pay for the cops having destroyed their house it's like uh the scene in the, that scene in the patriot where one guy just randomly fires and then everybody starts firing they just all shoot each other yeah stay tuned to see if that happens here at some point well apparently the 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 initial shoot the the initial 
exchange where the, the two sheriffs were killed and the third was injured, it wasn't him that fired the first shot. Uh, according to the story, it was the one of the other Posse Comitatus members uh, with him, mm-hmm. who I don't recall if they were, they were related or not. I don't I, I don't think they were. It was him and a man and a woman. I don't I don't remember the exact details, but yeah, he didn't supposedly he didn't fire the first shot, but he he basically responded and killed uh, killed two of them. And then the third was injured and he like took his gun and like talked shit to him while he was injured on the ground and then <laughs> took his police car and drove off, uh, went on the run, basically. Oh, that's just gangster as hell. That's an interesting story. Go ahead, skin it. Skin that smoke wagon and see what happens.